Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 68, The Academic Precariat. Now so many of you have asked me about career advice after, and also during, but particularly after your research masters and your PhD, and it is my pleasure to provide that information. But the answers that I give you can never be singular, can never be Fordist, because the age of our cohort at Flinders University vary from their early 20s right through to their late 70s. So that means the responses that I must provide for you have to be bespoke, customised, post-Fordist if you will. So I have to provide a suite of career options for you that are full-time, that are part-time, involve a large amount of information on consultancies and also working in the private and the public sphere. So before I work through those requests about employment and post-employment options for you after your PhD, I need to introduce a concept to you. And I believe this concept is probably one of the most important ideas that has been introduced in higher education studies in the last 10 years. And that concept is the precariat. I was always actually going to deliver this vlog on the precariat right at the start of this process over a year ago when I was thinking, mm, what possible vlogs could I think about going forward? So I was trying to make sure I had a list of 20 or 30 ideas before I started. Well, one of my first ideas was to do a vlog on the precariat. That's how important it is. But in the last 10 days or so, three rather remarkable, odd, disturbing things have happened to me and also my dear friends around the world. So I thought, hmm, it's probably timely right now before I start the heavy work on employability for you all that I present this vlog on the precariat. Now I just mentioned three stories that happened to me in the last 10 days or so, or indeed my friends, and I'm going to tell you those three stories now. So. Are you sitting comfortably? Well, if you are, you probably won't be at the end of these stories. One of my former departments where I was the head has just had a terrible shock. Something terrible has occurred to my former staff that I care about and love very deeply. Twelve of my former colleagues, my former staff, were drawn into a room and informed that all of them within six weeks would no longer be in work. All twelve were in effect sacked. They were told there would be four posts available, three of those posts would be permanent and one would be a two-year contract and they welcomed their applications if they would like to apply for those posts. 12 great colleagues, great academics, great teachers, great researchers, and remember they were permanent staff. They have families, they have mortgages, and simply they were told their services were no longer required. That's story one. Story two comes from a great friend of mine who's on a zero hours contract in the United Kingdom. Yes, you heard correctly, zero hours contract. He's just been offered a very high paying secondment in a British governmental department for a year. Very high paid, fantastic job. I'm really proud of him. But he's on this zero hours contract at the university. Remember, he's not being paid anything per week. He may get some payment for work or he may not, but it's a zero hours contract. And he was told that he's going to have to delay that secondment for at least three months because they're going to demand that he works through his three months notice before he takes that secondment, three months notice. So remember, he's not being paid anything and yet they're asking via this contract that he still works out his three months notice. Wow. So why is the university doing this? Well, this particular university has just sacked 124 full-time staff members and therefore they need a large casual pool of academics who can do that work while the university works out what it's going to do in the medium to long term. So they've simply sacked all the full-time staff and are reliant on this zero hours contract and part-time staff to fill in the gap for students 
in the mitigating period. Okay, so that's story two. Story three just happened to me last week. Now, I wrote an article for an Australian online journal. This is a full, fully refereed online academic journal. Uh, and I wrote that article 12 years ago. All going well. The journal contacted me last week and reported that that article had been used in an Australian study guide. So it had been used to teach students. It was a film article and it had been used to teach students. And the journal had received a $275 copyright on the basis of my article. So I wrote it, my copyright, my IP, and $275 as revenue had been made on the basis of my copyright and IP. And also, I never signed that copyright away to the journal. That's also important. Now, they asked that I not actually receive the payment for my article that I've written, but I donate that money to the journal. Now this was an article, like all of you, that I have written for free. I did all the research on that article. I bought all the books that were required to write that article. So I'd taken all the expense and now they're stating, oh right, well when there is a little bit of profit available via copyright breach, oh, uh, you can't accept that money. Would you give it to the journal out of the goodness of your heart? Mm -hmm. So this is the nature of academic life and these three stories provide I think a punctuation for what is going on at the moment. How do we understand these types of stories? And the answer is I think found in Guy Standing's book The Precariat. But before I get into this concept and its relevance to higher education, I wanted to just state that this isn't something that is new, that's happened in the last couple of years, that is something that's, for example, the post-global financial crisis. This sort of behaviour and treatment of PhD students in particular, and the part-time staff in universities, isn't new, it's always happened. I always remember, and it's a horrible moment for me, and I always get upset about it, so I apologise if I get upset on camera, but during the first year of my PhD, I was 24 years of age, I'd just finished a research master's the year before, and my supervisor told me that I would not be in full-time academic work until my mid to late 30s. 30s, I was 24, mid to late 30s. I wouldn't be in a full-time academic job till my mid to late 30s, and that I would be his part-time teacher working on his courses until then. And I always remember this dreadful, it was really almost a sadistic grin that was on his face. It's like basically, you are mine and you will do what I tell you to do. Right. So needless to say, I wasn't too impressed by this, like losing a decade of my life by somebody supposedly saying that's how my life is going to be. So within one month, I detained my first full-time academic post in Wellington, and I've never been unemployed or underemployed one day since that time, and I've never been since then another man's tutor. Boom. Now, he was wrong, and he was offensive. And that's actually the point I'm making today, because you are, as a PhD student in our higher education system, you are disempowered. And it's important to start from that basis. You are disempowered. And so therefore, you need to think about what you want, what type of employment, what type of funding, what type of salary, what type of wages you want in your life going forward. And to do that, to work out who you are, and how we empower you in international higher education means that you have to have a pretty good understanding of the political economy of international higher education. And that means you have to understand what is going on in universities far beyond Flinders, far beyond Adelaide universities, and far beyond Australian universities. You need to really think about the nature of academic employment. And that's why we're talking today about the precariat, because the precariat is also about you self-limiting your options. So I've received so many emails from all of you about, oh right, well, what sort of postdoc should I do? What sort of tutoring job should I take? What sort of lab demonstration role should I take? What sort of contract should I accept? What sort of teaching only contract 
should I accept? So they're the options that are often being presented to you. And there is no doubt that higher education requires PhD students and all of us to do those roles. And those roles will be part-time, they will be contract-based, and they will, yes, be casual jobs. So what Guy Standing was describing and analysing is this new formation. So this book, Guy Standing's The Precariat, was published in 2013 and it particularly evaluated the impact of the global financial crisis, the GFC, in 2008 and 2009 on the nature of employment. And yes, higher education, universities, was one of his clear and key case studies. So what Standing was showing was how all businesses, including universities, were transforming and transferring risk. And that risk was moving from entrepreneurs and bankers to workers. So instead of entrepreneurs and businesses and bankers taking the risk, they were moving as much risk as possible to the workforce. So the goal was flexibility so that workers had absolutely no security and employers had full control over the nature of their workforce. Full control. So Guy Standing argued that there were two groups in our culture right now, the precariat and the salariat. The precariat and the salariat. And we see both those groups in universities right now. The salariat are in stable, full-time employment. They have holidays, they have sick leave, they have superannuation, and they have permanence. The precariat describes the other group who really understand the insecurity that they are confronting right now and have a whole series of strategies to enable them to manage that insecurity. So the phrase the precariat actually was first used in the early 1980s to describe a temporary workforce and particularly seasonal workers often linked with agriculture. So this is the group post the creative industries, post the late 1990s, the knowledge economy. This is the group that manages insecurity and they manage what's often these days referred to as the portfolio career or the gig economy and I will do separate vlogs on those terms. So this is part-time work, this is underemployment, and this refers to zero hours contracts and often free types of internships. The grey or the black economy is also part of this movement that's these days referred to as the handshake economy. So for Guy Standing, universities particularly embody this movement from public good to private risk. Public good to private risk. Universities require what he describes as, quote, a floating reserve, end of quote. This is a group who are prepared to work 24-7, prepared to work digitally, prepared to work at home. So this is a completely different way of thinking about a university. And Standing describes this as, quote, the teacherless university. So remember, when anyone's talking about student-centred learning or flexible learning, it often is a critique of teachers and teaching, and indeed expertise, I would argue. So one easy way in which we disempower academics, disempower expertise, is say, oh look, anybody can teach. Anybody can teach. And that, of course, is disrespectful for you, because it's saying, oh right, well we don't need professors and people of expertise, even a PhD student can teach. So it is a critique of teachers and teaching. Now, that's been a radical change during my lifetime. When I was enrolled as a first year student in a posh elite university, I was taught by professors, they lectured, but the professors also tutored me and they also assessed my work. Now, most of you know I've committed my life to also teaching first year students. I taught first year students, I will teach them again, and I've taught first year students for 22 years. As a full professor holding a chair, I was said, oh, I was told, oh Tara, you can, you know, work and teach the fourth year students in the Canadian system, or the third year students and the honours and master's students in the British system. But I said, no, the best teachers should teach first year. The professors should teach 
first year. Now we rarely see that type of commitment these days because of the casualised workforce. So professors now may lecture, but they very rarely tutor and they certainly very rarely mark first year students. So this is our casualised workforce in higher education. Now this has benefits for you. I'm not presenting this as a, as a negative vlog this week. This system has a huge amount of benefit for you because there is plenty, plenty of casualised work for research masters and PhD students. So my last three jobs were as a head of school and a head of department. I would be writing the contracts out for our PhD students to do work each semester. And I would be signing off contracts for a 13 week semester for $20,000 for a PhD student because they were teaching three and four courses. No permanent staff were being hired, there was a freeze, so therefore casual staff, PhD students, gained a huge amount of work. So this is great for you, you can pay your bills. The challenge is that this work also pulls you away from your PhD. But again, it has advantages for those of you that require flexibility. You might have children, you might have a whole series of caring responsibilities, and therefore you do require a more flexible way of constructing your work-life balance, if I can use that cliche. So one of my former PhD students, brilliant woman, completed her PhD in three years, great topic. She has two wonderful children and her husband works FIFO. Okay, so just after her PhD, she accepted three days a week work for a particular university in Australia on a rolling contract. So every year, every 12 months, she would sign this contract to do this work, three days a week. She's been doing that type of work on a rolling contract for 12 years. Now that suits her, she's got a fantastic family, she's raised two beautiful daughters, and has a whole FIFO management of a, of a household that's required. We all know FIFO, very challenging to manage. And look, that has suited her. But can I also say she hasn't had a choice. She hasn't been able to decide, oh, look, maybe I'd like to go into a, a permanent job at this point. This is the contract that has been offered to her. There is, though, a change that is happening in our university sector that may alter this very interesting precariat structure that we're now living in and through. And that is the UK has just created a system and released the results from a TEF, a Teaching Excellence Framework. They've assessed the teaching quality of all the UK universities. And these results have been absolutely explosive because what they've discovered is the best universities, yes, the elite top end, do not have the best teaching or the best teachers. So what they've shown is the inverted commas best universities are mediocre with regard to teaching. And the impact of these results has just been debilitating for the sector. It's, it's just exploded in front of us. Because of course, if students are consumers, then why would they choose or select a substandard teaching experience? There's also, I think, a generational change that is emerging in our universities. The baby boomers are retiring from our university sector. So the generations that have had to manage this casualised and unstable working environment, that's my generation, Generation X, and also Generation Y and Z that follow me, may just be about to have our academic moment in the sun. I'm not hugely optimistic. I have been saying this for the last 10 years, and once more, I've been wrong. But... There is no doubt that if teaching and the relationship between teaching and research is transforming in our universities, then this may actually create a post-precariat system and structure. All of the discussion today that I've had with you it is really asking a meta question, isn't it? Why would the best and brightest in any culture, in any society, choose to live a professional life without security. Meta question of my life, meta question I think about every day when I'm talking with PhD students. But the other major question that is my responsibility as your Dean is to prepare you for the precariat, to prepare you 
for the portfolio economy, to prepare you for the gig economy. And therefore, what our next vlog is going to do, and these two are paired, is I'm going to look at academic mobility. So how you can pick and mix the nature of work in international higher education to suit you, suit your family, suit what you want for your future. So really the question is how we create a better academy for you and also all the wonderful students who will follow you. So before we can figure all those options that are available to you socially, economically and professionally, I do believe it is significant that we recognise the power and the potency of Guy Standings, the Precariat. And, and we recognise the damage, the deep personal and professional damage that this system has instigated to tens of thousands of students and academics. As always, I wish you love, light and peace. Tia. <laughs>